Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? We're good, we're good. Good to see you. Man, what a great day we're having so far. Nine o'clock service was good. Man, you guys are ready. You're ready for 11 o'clock. Listen, it's going to be a good day. And I just want to welcome you here if you're a guest. It's so great that you're here. Glad you're part of Extreme Church today. And if you're watching online at this live stream right now, welcome. This is going to be a good day. We're, we're in this series, and I'm pumped about the series. This is our third week, and we'll have one more after this one. But I'm just enjoying every part of this. You know, a lot of times Easter comes along, and we have an Easter service, Easter sermon, and we just kind of, it's it until next Easter, but this year we started the sermon series on Easter, and I wanted to carry it even longer. There's something about the cross of Jesus that changes your life. There's something about the cross that is really central to the Christian faith, and it really sets us apart from other religions, because on that day, we know, and here's, here's the crazy part that, boy, this is just so hard to understand, so difficult to understand, that a God would leave his... Um, all of his divinity, all of this divine things, and come to earth. And how does it even happen that a person can be 100% God and 100% human? We, we can't ever figure that out. But that's what took place. And when he came here, he had a purpose. And we'll talk a little bit about this in just a moment. But he came, he came here for a purpose. And this, what makes it unique, other religions, they have gods, they have prophets, they have their Messiah, but they don't have one that died and came to life. Ours lives, theirs will die. If, they, if, if theirs are still alive, he, he or she will die, but one thing that sets us apart is on that third day, he died, and on the third day, he came to life. And it's documented. It's, it, was, it was seen by many, many individuals. They, the Bible tells us that it's up to 500 people saw him alive after they saw him dead. That's a good thing. That's what makes the cross one of the most... Uh, important parts of the Bible. There's a lot of things we can study. There's a lot of things that we can uh, read about, and there's a lot of good things in the Bible from the front to the back. But the most central aspect is the cross. This is what sets us apart. This is what's so exciting because here's the thing. We see the very workings of the, the Trinity, the, the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. We see the workings of God for sure in the cross because the cross exemplifies God's character. Shows everything about God. I know you, you hear, I know some people even believe this and, and they even, and, and they, they see God as just this Old Testament God of just killing people and beating people up and and, you know, making standards that you can't live by. And, but the Bible tells me that God is love. That's His very character. And for God so loved us, the world, that He gave His Son. It's exemplified through His, his character, is exemplified through the cross. The cross also exemplifies God's love for the lost and love for you and me. The cross exemplifies God's justice, that the cross is a very picture of what had to happen to redeem His people. The Bible says that the life of the body is in the blood, and it has to be the blood that, that is, is used for the remission or the atonement or the... Um, Let's just call it what it is. It just gets rid of the sin in your life. Expels it. The cross is significant. And when Jesus hung on that cross, 
And Jesus looked towards heaven, and if and we know this from Scripture that God must have turned his back because he couldn't look upon the sin. Jesus carried everything. He had to. For you and I to be free and you and I to have freedom of everything in our life, someone had to carry that and redeem it. That became the justice of God as he looked down on sin and turned his back. And Jesus said, God, have you forsaken me? Felt alone. Jesus felt the weight of the world at that moment. He felt everything that you're going through in your life, every circumstance, every problem, every issue, every, everything that you suffer with and everything that you will go through in your life, he held it on him. Can you imagine having the weight of everything? You, we, we see our lives and we go through things and sometimes we think, I don't know that I can make it through this. It's such a weight. It's such a burden on me. But he carried everyone's burden. It, it, it just doesn't make sense sometimes how this could happen. But God sent His Son so that you and I can be free and we can be free from those things in our life. If we can just grab a hold of it and just understand and accept this idea of being crossfit. You say, well, well, what is the cross? Well, we explain the cross. The part about being fit, it is kind of defined in this way, that fit is a manner in which a person fits with something. And I believe that at the cross, Jesus made a way that believers can fit in with the cross. See, we couldn't fit in. We were enemies of God. The Bible says that, that, that the unbeliever, the sinner, is a, they, are a, they are an enemy of God. They're in conflict. But the cross made a way through our faith in Jesus Christ, not in anything that we can do, not in anything, you know, it's a good thing that it's not on looks for me. I'm glad it's not my looks that gets me what I need. It's not what I can do because I would fall short. The Bible says that every one of us falls short, but it's because of the faith in Jesus Christ that we have the opportunity to be fit for the cross. Cross fit. And if we can just grab a hold of that and understand that, then we can, we can realize that in the next few moments, these three points that I'm going to give you, these three things that I, I believe that will, will ch- just completely transform your life when you walk out of here today. How many of you know that if we come to church, let's, let's be transformed. Let's be changed. Let's, let's come in one way and leave different, leave better. And so I believe these three points will literally change your life today. They'll in, Not only that, but they'll encourage you. And I, I want us to be, uh, have a reawakening in our life. I want today, I want us to be, have a new fire and, and, and be stirred up. And I believe the Holy Spirit can do that if we'll open up and allow Him to do that today. He'll stir you up in some ways and He will encourage you and He will show you some things that will ultimately transform your life. I pray from the time I, I get in my office the, the, the week and start preparing the sermon, God transformed the people through this word. Transform all of us. And here's the good thing about my part is I get it before you do. And I get to just have it go through my mind all week. And I'm so pumped on Sundays because I feel like God has just taken me through this entire process of changing me. And then I get to tell you what he told me. And so we get to share it together, and that's what we do on Sundays. These three points, I I really need to um, set the scene before we go into these points because, and and I mentioned this on Easter, as we see the Easter story, when Jesus, if you can remember, I, I talked about this Easter Sunday, about when he walked to the graveyard and he called for Lazarus to come out of the grave. You know, the, the Lazarus had been dead a few days and I, I love this, I really love what Jesus did when he showed up because he wasn't in a hurry to get there. But I mean, he basically knew that he was going to be healed and brought back to life. But when he walked up to the scene, one of the shortest scriptures in the Bible for you Sunday school. Remember Sunday school? How many, how many went to Sunday school? Remember back in the old days, you went to Sunday school. 
We learned this at a very young age. The shortest scripture in the Bible, it says, Jesus wept. His heart broke when he saw the grief of the people that had lost a, a friend, a loved one, a, a, a brother. A, his heart went out and he began to weep. After that, he's coming into the town of Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's time for Passover. He's coming into the town of Jerusalem. And he's riding on a donkey, the Bible tells us. There's an entourage of people that's just behind him, a convoy of people that's just following him because Jesus always had people following him. In fact, there were times when Jesus had to completely get away from people. Listen, there's some people in your life that really, really get in the way of your mission. There's people that get in the way of your walk with Jesus Christ that we need to distance ourselves from. Jesus would get away. I've heard people throw things up at me, you know, and say, you know, well, you're a Christian, you're a pastor, you're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. You're sp- Listen, there's some people that I don't need to be around. There's some people that, that really cause my mission to go off course. And you have them in your life as well. Jesus was coming into the city and they were laying palm branches on on the ground, their garments, so he could walk across. And you remember we talked about this. There was a roar that was going through the crowd and they were were, uh, praising him, glorifying him, thanking him. They had seen all those miracles. They had seen things happen. They had watched Jesus perform signs and wonders. A roar going through the crowd of people just... I can't, I can't imagine the sound. And just five days later, you know, there's a roar saying, crucify him. I'm just wondering, maybe in our life, sometimes we see people that maybe just fall into this idea of because there's a hyped up worship team up here playing and there's lights and there's fog and all of the intensity behind the music. Man, that's so good. And I'm just going to tell you this. When we miss Sunday mornings, we miss what we miss. This, we miss exactly what you we had right here this morning. Some awesome worship. What an incredible! Even the first service, it was so intense. The music, the worship is so incredible to stand. And I want to encourage you that if you come in here, that we always turn the lights down low, kind of set that atmosphere. Is to find a time when you can release the expressions in your life. You say, "Well, that's not really my personality." I'm going to tell you this, you get excited about something in your life, you smile and you even sometimes give a little hoop and a holler, move, your, move around a little bit. You get excited about something and you get excited. You may clap your hands, you go to ball games and your kids you know, do something well and you clap your hands, you get pumped. It's, it's expressions, everybody has them. Find that time to release those expressions during worship and I'm going to tell you this, once you do it and start doing it, it will change your life. Then you won't care if the lights are down low or not. You're going to, show, you're going to express how you feel about Jesus. They begin to express this, and then I, I wonder sometimes if, if it's not the hype, if it's not what, what they bring into their own minds about what church is and about, oh, wow, that was an awesome message, and, man, it hyped me up, pet me up, and, we, and within five days we're, we're back to where we used to be. Nothing's changed. I'm going to tell you this. You get, a, you get a true, authentic experience with Jesus Christ, and He seriously changes your life. You won't go back. You will make some mistakes, but you get that inside of you, and it will come out of you. It can't help but come out of you. So we see Jesus go into this city. They go to Passover, and we, we've seen the artistic, um, what, a, what a great art that we've seen of Jesus, the Leonardo da Vinci painting in the 1400s of Jesus and his disciples around him. Well, I can still see that from a kid. I remember seeing it on the wall. And I remember seeing Jesus and all the disciples leaned over. And, and it looks like they're just leaned forward watching him. 
Now, it's, a, it's kind of a wrong rendition of the real culture that they had. I mean, Jesus is sitting in the center, and everybody's sitting around the table, and they're leaning over. The Bible tells us they were sitting, but they were reclined. The, the his, history tells us that the culture was that they would sit in their chairs and, they, chairs, and they would put their feet up, kind of like I would in my recliner that I love so much, and they reclined, but still... They're sitting in this Last Supper setting, and Jesus starts a discourse. And we're going to see this unfold in John chapter 14 today. The chapter, the book of the person who says, the one that Jesus loved. Can you imagine writing a book in the Bible, and all you hear is the one that Jesus loved, the one that Jesus loved. Boy, you, John, you're arrogant. No, I'll tell you about John. Is he secure in who he is in Christ? And I think we need to get to that point where we can say, I'm the one Jesus loves. The one that Jesus loves. And John was secure in that. And he's, he begins to write in, in chapters 12 and 13. He begins to write where Jesus sits down and he begins to speak to his disciples. The, the three years that he moved through the earth doing the miracles. There were so many people gathered around him all the time. He got very few moments where he had with the disciples, and he taught them throughout the three years. But this is a moment where they could sit around the table. And I'm going to tell you this. More things will happen in your family when you sit around the dinner table and you begin to eat. You're going to find out a lot of things. A lot of family time can happen around that dinner table instead of sitting in your recliners, which we do sometimes, I will admit. I love to sit in my recliner and eat. But my wife has this deal. She wants the whole family around the table because we start talking to each other and we start loving on each other. It really brings out some great things. And as Jesus found this last few moments with his disciples, he began to pour his heart out to them like he had never done before. And in 12 and 13, he begins to talk about what's getting ready to happen. If you read chapters 12, 13, and 14, you'll see it's all in, almost every bit of it is in red. Jesus is speaking to them. And if I put myself in that place and I'm thinking, what would I feel like if I was sitting around that table? Because Jesus started saying, listen, guys, it's like this. In just a few moments, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm leaving you. They're killing me. He began to tell them. He even questioned. He said, should I ask God to take me out of this? With a question mark. And answers his own question in the next line that says, but this is what I'm called here to do. This is what I came for. And I can see the disciples backing off in their chair going, oh my, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen? But Jesus goes on, and he says, not only am I going to die and give up my life for the, for the world, but one of you will betray me. Can you imagine their hearts falling to the floor? Jesus, there's only 12 of us, 13 of us in here, one, 12 of us and one of you. Which one is it? And Jesus told him instantly who it was. You're going to betray me, so go do what you're going to do. Leave. Go do it. That's a little disheartening. Then it gets even better. He tells one of them, you're going to deny me. And what did Peter tell him? Lord, I would never deny you. I'd die for you. He says, Peter, I can just see Jesus. I'm sure Jesus didn't say it like I would. But I'm sure that he wanted to. <laughs> Peter, shut up for a minute. Listen to me. Before the rooster crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, Lord, I would never do that. Shut up and listen to me. This has to happen. In fact, Jesus tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. Wait a minute, Jesus. I'm the one. I'm, I'm the one. Peter was the one that did all the talking. He, he's the one that couldn't keep his mouth shut. Peter, I'd die for you, Jesus. I'm the rock. You called me the rock. I'm the one that's going to launch the church. I wouldn't deny you. Listen to me. Can you imagine 
what their hearts felt like. Oh, my gosh. What are we going to do? Jesus did this whole discourse for three chapters. And then he goes into 14, chapter 1, the first part. Before I get there, i gotta, I got to say this. I'm going to pump you up just a little bit. Because some of this sermon is going to be preachy. Okay, Did a little teaching there just to get you ready for a little bit of preaching. Because I want you to hang on to your seat on some of this. Because I believe we need it. How many know that the truth will set you free sometimes, and we don't want to hear it sometimes, but we need it? But watch this. I'm going to pump you up right here. I believe our time here on earth is about over. I believe we're closer to heaven than we've ever been. So if you're you're here today and you're hearing my voice, quit playing church. Stop playing with Jesus. Start, stop just making him something you visit on a Sunday morning and give your life to him. Because this is going to end so soon. He's coming back. Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven, and, and with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, first the believers who have died, they're six feet under, will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, we who are still alive, six feet above ground, will wait on them, and then we will join with them and be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. This is going to happen. This is a weird scripture. I hear people say, "This I, 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 can't, I, can't, I can't even... Get this. I can't even download this. I can't compute what he's saying. I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I got a pretty good idea. It's what we call the rapture. This is the English word we have. They're using caught up. We say rapture. That there's going to come a day when I... Really, I'm I'm kind of looking for... I think Jesus kind of leaves us in the dark. So whenever it happens, like this is even better than I read it. But it's going to happen. You say, well, I've heard this all my life. I have too. I've heard it all my life. I'm 53 years old, working on 54. From the time I can remember, I was in church. I told you this, I think, last week. I remember hearing this. It's been 50-something years, and I still hear it, and I still believe it. I believe it's closer now than it's ever been. Read in the papers. Watch the news. Jesus is going to come back. He doesn't know. Neither do the angels. The Bible says that not even the Son Himself or the angels know the day. Only God knows. And one of these days, God's going to say, it is finished. Go get the church. And I know. I've heard it all my life. When's it going to happen? What's taking so long? And I think we can see part of this in this next passage in 2 Peter, where the writer states this. And remember, our Lord's patience gives people time to be saved. There's people in your life, my life, all of our friends, family that are not ready. We say, Jesus, come quickly, like John in Revelation. At the end of Revelation, he says, Lord, come quickly. I think we pray that, and you know, I'm good with it. If he, if he comes before this service is over, before I even get to finish, I'd like to finish, Lord. I took all this time preparing. I would like to finish, but you can come back anytime you want. It would just make it easier on all of us. But we pray that, we think it, we want it. But do we want to leave friends and family and loved ones behind? I don't think so. Jesus was telling the disciples, this is what's going to happen. They were, they were in turmoil. I can imagine what they were thinking. And so Jesus switches gears and then he goes into his, his encouraging part of his discourse. I always heard, I always thought as a leader, you said the good stuff first, then you give them the bad stuff. There was a reason Jesus told them what he told them. It wasn't just to give them bad news. He told them so they would be prepared, so they would be ready, and so they would understand that he was who he was. 
And then he states this in verse 1. John, the one Jesus loved, stated it this way. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus, you just spent two chapters giving us some story that would depress anyone. And now you want to switch it and say, don't let your hearts be troubled. I don't think the passage sometimes gives it everything that it needs to give it by us just reading the words. I think Jesus looked at him and he said, listen to me. Listen. All these things have to happen. But guess what? You guys win. You win. Don't be all messed up about it. Be excited. Be pumped that I'm getting ready to go to the cross because I'm getting ready to save the world for eternity. Don't be downhearted. I know I, that's not, that scripture was a little mild compared to what I'm making it, but I feel like that it was just written. But I believe that Jesus was looking at him going, come on, be pumped. This is good. It's good stuff. Don't let your hearts be troubled. The first thing that I want you to see is that in our lives is don't let the things going on around you throw you off course. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I want to encourage you today. Don't let the things going on around you throw you off course. Too many times we let the things around us, all our troubles, the problems, all the issues, all the things we're going through, it it messes with our mind. Our minds get off course and then we get off course. Stay on course. Let me just say it like this. You're going to have problems whether you're on course or not. You're going to have problems whether you're on course or not. Stay on course. It's a lot easier when you have problems. you got someone to go to. There's four things that I'm, I'm going to throw out here at you today that I believe that gets us off course, causes us to lose our focus and gets us off course. And I may get a little, I may preach a little bit in some of them. But the first one's this. One of the things that gets us off course is a busy schedule. Pastors are, the, are some of the most busiest people in the world, if that's even a word. Or even the right way to say it. And you're saying, well, how dare you to, to brag about being the busiest whenever I'm this busy. I'm talking about being busy on just being busy. We need to get unbusy. Especially pastors because we go to our offices and we're so busy throughout the day. We're doing God's work. Next thing you know, you get to the end of the day and it's like, what did I even accomplish? Didn't read the Bible. Didn't really pray today. I felt like I was doing God's work, but I don't even know what I did. We're too busy. I've gotten to the point I'm changing my life. I'm I'm trying to be more structured. I'm a rabbit chaser. And... When I go into my office, I may chase 50 rabbits during the day and never accomplish a thing and think, boy, what what did I even do? I've been keeping a log every day, and I write the first thing that I do. I try to get here at 8.30. Sometimes it's 9. 8.30 to 9.30, Bible and prayer. I go to the next thing from 9.30 Depends on, it depends on how much time I want to spend on the sermon at that one moment. 9.30 to noon. It's going to take me a long time here. But I log it down and I take a highlighter. That hour's gone. Did I do what I needed to do? I take my phone and I slide it up. I take the bottom. You know those iPhones, you can slide the bottom up and you can hit do not disturb. Because every time I get to reading the Bible, I get to pray Stinking phone vibrates. And what do I do? I check it. And it's stupid notifications. And they tell us that when you take your mind and move from one thing to the next, it takes several minutes to get it back on focus again. And I've decided that I'm going to spend my time first of the day, first of the moment in my office in prayer and Bible. And I don't want any disturbance. When I get through reading it, when that hour's over, I'll look down at my phone to see if my wife has texted me or if it's important. And I'll, 
usually take care of it. Busy. We get so busy in our lives that it, it throws us off track. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and 15. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. How many know we're living in evil days? Read the newspaper, watch the news, and you'll know really quick this is evil days. If we truly desire to walk close to God, your schedule might have to be changed. Your hectic schedule might be affecting your relationship with Jesus. And I'm not saying to get rid of your schedule. There's things we have to do, places we have to go, people we have to see. But how many times do we take our schedules and fill it with things that's not necessary and we find ourselves at the end of the day, I didn't even pray, didn't even read my Bible. But we got in four hours of TV. Whoops. That went to preaching. I'm going to back up a little bit. Let me go to the next one. Let's go to number two. Another thing that will throw us off track is competitive love. Competition with God. Now I'm really going to get preachy. Let's do it. How about it? Those things that come between God and you become idols. They become little gods. We have the, maybe, maybe not you, but me. Sometimes my mindset of a God is something that's alive or something that was alive. Did you know that they had gods in the Bible that were just things sitting on a shelf? They worshipped pieces of gold. They, they fashioned them really cool, though. They fashioned them, fashioned them into things so they just didn't look like a chunk of gold. Did you know that we can worship our kids to the point that they will distract us and become in between God and our lives? Things come into competition with coming to church on Sunday morning. And they say, Pastor, here you go. Let's just ride this for a moment. If you don't agree with me, that's okay. I'm telling you the truth anyway. When we put things in place of where we need to be and where we're supposed to be, it becomes an idol. You're supposed to be in church on Sunday morning and you're supposed to be in the house of God with other believers. It's scriptural. The reason it gives us community, we get closer we, it's, it's better for our lives. It helps us make it through this process better. It just works. God knew it would work. And He designed it that we are together. But we allow things to separate us on those Sundays. And we make excuses for it because our child is going to be the next star. Our child is going to be the next pro ball player. Our child is going to be the next happening thing in the world. And we place them, they distract us. And I'm going to tell you this, that if your child takes the place of your time in the house of God, not only is it, is it will affect you, but it will affect your child. I'm telling you, as a pastor and as a counselor, and someone that cares about you and your family, one day, your child will either be a part of the church because we train them up in the way they should go. I'm not saying it always works out that way, but they won't forget it. And most of them will come back. Most of them will be a part of it. And I'm not telling you anything that I wouldn't do. When our kids were growing up, they weren't allowed to do anything on Sunday morning because it interfered with the place that we felt like as parents they needed to be. Because I can tell you this, this is better than that out there. 
And now they're serving in the church. They're raising their kids to be here every Sunday. Did we play sports on Sunday? Absolutely. But it was after church was over. And they were, Kimberly would be in the car, our daughter would be in the car, and we would be rushing out of the church, getting in the vehicle, and she's on her way to Tulsa, slinging clothes, putting on ball clothes, because she already missed one game. Because our, our idea was that game can wait because church, God, is, is the most important thing in our life. Did we always get it right? Absolutely not. But we didn't let some kind of love compete with the love of God. Look at verses um, um, 15 in 1 John chapter 2. Do not love this world nor the things it offers. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now let's clarify that. Because it makes it sound like that you can't love anything here. And I'm going to tell you, I love some things in my life that I do. I have a lot of fun. You do too. Even though some of you might be really quiet out there right now and you don't want to, you don't want to have that look on your face because I see expressions. We love doing things. That's not the problem. The problem's not that we just, oh, we're Christians so we can't have any fun and do anything. We just kind of got to just sit there all day, wait for church on Sunday. No, what he's saying is, is when those things compete with the love of God, they take the place of God, then what happens is, is that you don't have the love of the Father in you. Because if you have the love of the Father in you, those things about loving Jesus will come out of you first. Okay, as soon as I get through these four, it's going to be more encouraging, less preachy, okay? So let's just get through them. Help me get through them. The third thing, first is busy schedule, second was competitive love. The third thing is this, is discouragement. And I really, I'm really sad about this sermon because I've, I've really enjoyed preparing it, and it, it, time goes by so fast. I should have made a two-part out of this one. Discouragement is, is, is a killer when it comes to throwing us, off, throwing us off track. We get discouraged. We get down. And everybody does it. But it throws us off track. Discouragement can drag people away from God. They focus on the problem instead of God. When we need to be running to God and letting Him help, help us focus on something other than the problem. The writer in 1 Peter chapter 5, 7 states this, Give all your worries and cares to God, for He cares about you. He seriously cares about you. One other scripture says, Don't be anxious for anything. Instead, pray about everything. Don't worry about anything instead of pray about it. Well, it just didn't go away when I prayed. You know what? There's some problems it takes a little while for it to go away. But He helps us through it. He helps us in our weaknesses. That's why He went to the cross. The fourth thing is material stuff. Yeah, we got some material. We got some stuff, man. I've seen some of the garages. You, you should see some of the garages we go in. There's some stuff out there. Some of it can't even fit in the garage. So much stuff. We like our stuff, though. It's, it's fun stuff. I'm not going to lie to you. It's good. What's wrong with it? We want to have fun. We need stuff. But when it comes... Between you and God, it becomes an idol. It becomes something that will throw you off track and throw you off course. Why can't we just have fun with the stuff and still make God priority? We can. The enemy, though, messes with our mind. He makes us think that this stuff's so much important that I'm just going to let you go for a God until I need you. I'm, gonna play, I'm just going to play with my toys. And when I need you, God, I'll let you know. Why can't we just have the best of both worlds? God, I make you priority. And thank you for giving me my stuff to play with. I mean, come on. We don't stop playing just because we grow up. We just have more expensive toys. 
We have fun. Let's go to the second part so I can move through this fairly quick. Jesus first said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to go ahead and skip to this next verse. In John 14, 1b, the second part of this. I throw them off back there whenever I skip, but I will be skipping on some other ones. By the way, media team, be ready. I'm going to skip some other ones. I, 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 they, they love me. They love me. Trust in God and trust also in me. First, he tells them, don't let your hearts be troubled. Come on, guys, this is a good thing. But don't let the, the distractions from the world get you so messed up that you forget that you can trust me. That you can trust me. The second thing that I want you to see is don't let the negative voices of those around you determine who Jesus is in your life. Don't let people tell you who Jesus is in your life. Don't let people tell you that you don't love Jesus. Don't let those negative voices tell you other than what Jesus tells you. The enemy wants... It's, it's, a, it's really kind of unique how the, how the enemy works. Because the enemy has no power over you. God has given you all authority and power over the enemy. Am I telling you the truth? You know where his power comes from? You and me. And people around us. Those, those family members that were around. Those friends that were around. That lets the enemy come out of them. The flesh and the blood... That's our problem, is the enemy works through us, and we let him. So, why would we let these negative voices? Because we start believing what people's telling us when we need to push out the voices. Sometimes we can't even hear God because of all the, the voices. I'm, I'm the worst. I, I have trouble keeping quiet. And I'm, I'm sure sometimes, I, I think, I, I see this in my own mind. I'm not sure God wouldn't be this sarcastic like I would. But I'm, I can see God sometimes telling me, would you just shut up for a moment and I'll speak to you. Just be quiet. I'm like, I'm trying, Lord. <laughs> I'm talking and I can't shut up. The old prophet Elijah in the Old Testament he went through some voices that, that had him messed up. Elijah had just performed a huge, well, he, he didn't really perform it. God performed it, but he set it up, this huge miracle where fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice that had buckets of water poured all over it. God had done some amazing things and showed up in Elijah's life. And then one voice from a woman that scared him, he ran, terrified, and he was trying to hear God's voice. And through all the chaos in his life, he wasn't hearing. He was pleading, God, I, I need to hear your voice. The Bible tells us he goes up on the mountain and here comes the windstorm or the, or the tornado come blowing through and he thought for sure God was going to be in that tornado tearing things apart, ripping things apart. This is God. He's coming in strong. But there was no voice in the, in the tornado. Next, there, there was the, the earthquake was shaking and rattling and tearing down things and breaking rocks and busting rocks. And surely God's going to be in this. But God wasn't there. Then the fire. God surely is going to be in the fire. No voice. After it was all done, there was a silence and a stillness. And in the quietness, there was a whisper. God began to speak to him in this still, small voice. I think sometimes God's saying, shut up for a moment. Get away from all the chaos, all the voices, all the negative things going through your head. Find me in a quiet moment, and I'll speak to you. And all of a sudden, you hear this voice. change your life. 1 Timothy 4.1 states this, 
Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, some will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. There's voices that will teach us bad stuff. Anything, anytime you ever hear anything that comes in your head that doesn't sound right, you need to check Scripture. There's too many voices out there that try to hinder us and try to throw us off track. Be sensitive to the voice of God. Sometimes we just need to get past all the chaos, turn the TV off and shut down everything and just find our, our closet, so to speak, that area where we can get away with God and just let Him speak. Let's go to the third thing. Verses 2 through 4. John states this, there, there is more than enough room in my father's home. You know, as he went from don't be discouraged, don't be troubled, listen to me, trust me. I've made room for you in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready... I will come and get you. When God, basically what he's saying, when God tells me and everything's ready, I'm going to come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I am going. First of all, don't let those things distract you to get you off course. And the second thing is don't listen to the voices, the negative voices. And the third thing is this, don't give up on God. He will send Christ one day to take us into heaven. It's going to happen. If anyone tells you that that's just, that's just a bunch of, of, of nonsense, that Jesus is going to come back and say, that's okay, just because you don't believe it doesn't make it true, non-true. It's true. It's real. It's going to happen. If we believe that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, then we need to believe that one day Jesus is going to step out in the cloud and He's going to call us all home. But here's the deal. There is only one guarantee of occupying heaven. If, if I could give you the, the, the one key that would unlock heaven for you, would you want it? Be ready. How, how do you get ready? Those who confess with their mouth the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. Believe in your heart that God had raised Him from the dead and you shall be saved. Believe in your heart. Have faith. Know. Have it in your heart. Trust Jesus. Know Him. Let Him be your Savior. That is a guarantee that you will be in heaven one day. You can't work hard enough. You can't be good looking enough. You can't do enough to make it. He says, don't give up on God. Be ready because Jesus has prepared a place for you. I'm going to close it out with this. And then we're going to pray for you this morning. We're going to do things a little different than we normally do. I felt this morning during prayer time that I needed to do this. We don't normally do this, but I just I felt in my spirit that I need to pray for some of you. Not, not just from up here. I'm going to come down front, and, and those of you that will come forward, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you one-on-one. -on -one. I feel like that's what I need to do today. But sometimes we wonder about Jesus and we have questions about, well, I can't see Jesus. Never, never, I've never seen Jesus. Can't see God. It's kind of difficult to believe when you can't see. If you're like me, I have trouble with faith. Faith is a really hard thing for me. I'm a see it to believe it type person. I want to hold it, want to touch it. I got to see it. God has stretched me so far with this faith stuff that sometimes you just have to step back and say, you know what, this doesn't make any sense to me, but God, you, I believe you, and I trust you. And if you're here today and you've had trouble believing in God, you, you're having trouble believing in who He is, and you can't tangibly reach out and touch God, if you have trouble with that, let me show you something. It was in Hebrews chapter 11, the, the writer talks about all these people of faith. He said, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed God. 
It was by faith that, that Noah obeyed God. Many people, it was by faith that they believed God. And God called them righteous. It's by faith. God's not moved by anything other than faith. But we see Jesus every day. You saw him when you came in the door this morning. When you walked through the door and, and came into contact with Skyler and him not open the door for you, or when you met our, war, our greeters out front, or when you walk in the door and the first thing that you hear is in worship, the worship team bringing us into this atmosphere of worship, and we begin to thank Jesus and praise him and gratify him, you start seeing Jesus. People see Jesus in you every time that you reach out to help someone. When you help someone, they're seeing Jesus in you. You may not feel like it's really that spiritual, but I'm just going to help this person out. I just feel like I need to help them. That's Jesus. They see Jesus in you. And there's a parable in the Bible that talks about this. And when and, and they, they were asking Jesus, how, how did we do this for you? Jesus was like, you, you did this for me. How, how did... I, did, I don't remember doing that for you. And he, he gave him a parable. And he stated this in Matthew. Let's pull, that, let's pull that scripture up in Matthew chapter 25, verse 40. And the king, Jesus, says, I'll tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Every time you extend a hand to someone, even in your job, some of your jobs, you help people. Did you know Jesus can show up coming out of you in what you do? CrossFit people have Jesus written all over them. Don't let the things going on around you throw you off course. And don't let the negative voices of those determine who Jesus is in your life. And don't give up on God. He will send Christ soon. Be ready. Don't, don't stop playing church and stop playing with Jesus like he's, like he's some toy that, that we just have and we just want him whenever we want to play. Stop playing. Either, either get in or neglect him. Jesus even made the comment in Revelation. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. It's lukewarm. I won't go into the theological part of that and why he said that, but what he would, but really, either get in or out. If you're going to get in, go in full force. Jesus, I'm going to serve you. I may, I may make mistakes. It may look ugly for a while, but I'm going in. I'm all in. Let's get in this. Be ready. He's coming back. He's coming back for a person in the church that is spot free. You say, what? I, I make mistakes. That's not what he's talking about. When he's talking about spot free, he's talking about people who have given their heart to Jesus and they see him as their Savior. They love him. They serve him. Thank God he's not coming back after perfect people. You all would go and I'd be left behind. Come on, buy into it. Let's get in this thing and do it. Serve him with all your heart. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we thank you. God, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being Jesus. Thank you for being our Savior, our Messiah. What's up, guys? My name is Bo Gaines, and I'm the creative director here at Extreme Church, and we are so excited that you joined us this week for our live stream. To find out more about us, you can visit extremechurch.org or check us out on Facebook. If you're interested in becoming a part of the life change that's happening through Extreme Church, you can give online at extremechurch.org or text the word give to the number on the screen. Thank you so much for joining our live stream. Be sure to subscribe and hit the bell. That way you're notified whenever we go live. And we'll see you next week.